Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending May 20th, 2017. First up, this is from NPR.org. Scientists glued fake caterpillars on plants worldwide. Here's what happened. Dozens of scientists recently glued fake green caterpillars onto plants around the world. An unusual study to see how the caterpillars risk of getting eaten varied from pole to pole. Now, they even acknowledge it on this that it's kind of obvious if you think about it that the more uh, the caterpillars were um, set out closer to the equator, the more of them were attacked and you know trying trying to be eaten by predators. And the closer they got to each pole, the less. But uh, the main thing about this is getting the statistics together to see what the rates of predation were. Now they were not able to. Uh, one thing they did find out that was surprising to me is caterpillars were mo way more subject to attacks by small insects, especially ants, than they were to any kind of predation by birds or any kind of um, large, you know, flying ball birds. Yeah, basically, I, I really thought birds were the ones that snatched caterpillars up uh, and uh, took care of them and used them for food more than anything else, and it ended up being the ants that did that. So. Um, the other thing it can do is, is it can lay down statistics to where if you keep retesting in areas, you can see any changes in predation too, and let you know that way it'll let you know about changes in the environment. For example, if there's way more predation, um, the next test they do, you know, or the next series of tests they do, if there's more predation in the pole region, the polar region, you know, insects are spreading to the polar regions. If there's less in a certain area, it could be because something's harming the insects in that area. One thing they couldn't test for is they know a lot of Caterpillars are subject to predation by parasite uh, wasps that sting them, and then uh, they actually stay alive, but then they grow embryos inside them, and um, it's it's kind of gruesome if you actually want to look it up, but about uh, parasite wasps and caterpillars. So uh, basically, the way these models are made, they're made out of a soft type of plasticine clay, and um, so that they can detect bite marks and scratches and stuff like that, but they still don't have a way to detect any kind of uh, this parasite wasp attack. So. Hopefully they'll be able to do that in the future. And next up, this is from Joseph L. And from the website space.com, SpaceX launches super heavy communications satellite. Uh, in this case, space, now SpaceX usually um, is the one that's pretty well known, and I've talked about it before, that they can actually land and reuse the lower stage. Well, because this was a heavy launch of a communications satellite um, that needed all the thrust it po possibly could, they had to end up using all of the fuel to get it up into orbit. So um, this particular uh, first stage was not able to be reused. It just had to, to drop and be lost. So the 23-story tall booster, and by the way, you can see the video to this, um, the 23-story full tall story tall booster soared off its seaside launch pad which once hosted NASA's space shuttle and Apollo moon rockets at 7:21 p.m. eastern daylight time it was uh, sixth of more than 20 missions SpaceX plans to fly this year they actually have even though the fact about um, nine or ten launches ago they had an explosion they have a backup of 70 people wanting to pay for more missions so this was a 13,400 pound uh, payload the Inmarsat five f4 communication satellite it's commercial communication satellite if you uh, uh, like having internet service on airplanes and stuff like that um, this is something for big commercial uses to supply internet to customers so yeah the falcon booster uh, is going to eventually end up in a station geostationary orbit 22,300 miles you can see during the launch they take it all the way up to a parking orbit i guess what they do first is they put it into a parking orbit and then later um, fire the uh, main engine whatever is left to uh, put it up into ge geostationary orbit so if you want to you can check out the video that's included and next up from my friend Michael J and I this is from IFL science doomsday vault flooded after permafrost perma I can't talk today permafrost melts due to climate change now I've been keeping track of this too this uh, it's called this the Svalbard global seed vault and I just kind of assumed if they were going to Oh, let me, I got a radio going in the background here. Let me, let me turn that radio off. I just assumed that this um, vault, if anything, they would make it pretty much waterproof. And I guess at least the seed containers must be waterproof because they said even though the uh, vault was flooded that the seeds are still okay. But um, here it is. It's, it's a fail-safe seed storage facility built to stand the test of time and the challenge of natural or man-made disasters. Um, 
the organization tasked with, uh, the, let's see, reads, Crop Trust, the organization tasked with protecting global crop diversity. However, the impenetrable fortress easily succumbed to the forces of nature as record heat hit the region. This led to higher than usual melting and heavy rains instead of snowfall. Buried deep inside a sandstone mountain in the Arctic, uh, I won't even try to pronounce the archipelago, meltwater gushed into the entrance and subsequently froze, so they had to end up chopping it back out. It was not in our plans to think that the permafrost could be there and that it would experience, would not be there and that it would experience extreme weather like that. Um, that's not good engineering. If you don't think every every piece of ice on this earth has probably been water or water vapor or steam at one time, um, just like every drop of water has turned to ice at one time, so not thinking of the fact of possible flooding. So uh, I guess now they're going to have to include waterproofing into this uh, idea of protecting the seeds. But yeah, this is something they were supposedly designing a, a vault to store seeds for all eternity, but kind of neglected the part about flooding. And if you get a chance, they got some good pictures here. Um, at the end of last year in Spitsbergen, average temperatures warmed by seven degrees above normal with the climate rapidly changing and the permafrost melting. Vault managers must now find a way to protect the world's largest collection of seeds. Um, they're going to dig trenches and try to divert the meltwater and also install pumps too. Now, I think they need to do a little bit better than that too because if this is supposed to last, you know, thousands of years or hopefully tens of thousands of years, who knows, um, you're not going to have necessarily guaranteed power to power the pumps and stuff. So you need to do a little better job than that maybe. Put it somewhere where you've got natural drainage or pick another location, maybe high up in a mountain or something like that. Maybe just build a vault in another location. But didn't quite, uh, didn't quite think of this when they designed it, I guess. So anyway, thank you everybody that sent in the links. I really appreciate that. And uh, take care everybody. I will catch you next week.